Good evening and welcome back to Symphony Tacoma's Facebook live chats, up close and personal with our musicians. Thank you for joining us tonight. Let us know that you're here. Please put a comment in so that we can engage with each other in the backstage chat window. In fact, I'm going to be in the chat window too because this week we have decided to pre-record this segment and avoid any muting of our audio from Facebook so that we can ensure you a smooth ride on Saturday Night Live with Symphony Tacoma. So please take a moment to share this and let all your friends know you're watching this post by hitting share with my friends. Thank you for being with us over this series. This has been a, a wonderful ride and learning curve and it's been fantastic getting to know our musicians closer and, and hearing some of their stories behind the scenes and their practice routines and their passions. This has been an eight week series, which will uh, also be broadcast on YouTube from Simply Tacoma. And if you're looking for those other programs, they are all available for you to watch on symphonytacoma.org's blog page. So if you can find your way to that, there'll be a segment of eight programs. We hope that they are uplifting and engaging for you in these challenging times when we can't be together. Um, so I wanted to let you know tonight's episode, it's all about the physicality of being a musician in performance and what needs to go into your preparation to be really physically fit on your instrument or even on the podium. We have two wonderful guests for you. Christopher Burns is our principal bassist, and we also have Alison Antorina, the physical therapist from South Sound Physical Therapy, Tacoma. And as you can see, I'm wearing their 
t-shirt uh, to thank them for their wonderful sponsorship of Symphony Tacoma and also for all of the great um, training that you've been giving our musicians and myself about how to be ready and physically fit on to do our jobs as musicians. So before we go any further, I want to um, take a moment to introduce our special guest, Christopher Burns. Chris is not only the symphony principal bassist, but he also freelances as a regular performing musician with Seattle Symphony, Seattle Opera, and Pacific Northwest Ballet. Chris is also an active solo concerto artist. And if you logged on a little bit early, you will have heard him playing solo bass concerto with Symphony Tacoma in my very first performance with Symphony Tacoma back in 2013. And that was Nino Rota's Divertimento for Double Bass and Orchestra. And that was the third movement that you heard, quite a virtuosic piece. We don't typically consider the bass a virtuoso instrument, but certainly when you listen to that, you recognize it takes um, great chops and immense physical strength to produce what Chris just did in that performance. I'm really delighted to have him with us here. He is also a phenomenal teacher. He is the orchestral teacher at University Place School District's Narrows View Intermediate School. And the kids absolutely love him. And he won the 2015 Teacher of the Year Award for the whole district. So congratulations on that great accomplishment. I know that he's also much loved by his wonderful family, Noelle Burns, who's also our oboist and English horn player. And they have two wonderful girls aged 13 and six. So Chris is a really busy guy. So I truly thank him for taking the time out on practically the last week of the semester of social distancing school, which is, I can tell you, is really difficult. Um, Chris, please join us. Thank you for taking time out to be with us this week. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to do this and be part of this. And thank you for playing the Rota to begin the program. It was fun to hear that again. What a great memory playing that. And I can't, yeah, seven years ago. I can't believe it. It is, uh, hasn't time flown and time is kind it of does. still right now, but yet we've been able to do some great things like bring you guys to, to meet our friends on social media and interact and have some really interesting conversations with our musicians. So yes. thank you for joining us at this extremely busy time for you. Sure. It um, is a busy time. Yes. Uh, teaching music as I've been doing uh, under these circumstances, it takes a lot of work and it has been busy time. Yes. That's right. And, and are you able to play the bass as you usually do? Have you got a, a good practice routine where you're kind of keeping your virtu virtuoso chops in intact is that hard during this time oh uh, yes it's very difficult because as you know uh, having a family and children during this time as well as trying to keep teaching it's a lot to have on one's plate and um even though a lot of things have closed down temporarily it doesn't mean that some of us have a lot more time so um yeah i i have had less time to play the bass but it is a source of um uh, it, it refuels my spirit to play it. So mm -hmm. I have tried to find time to work on some pieces that I've never played before that I've always meant to get to, just a little bit at a time to to keep that uh, musical fire going and because it, it does refresh my, my soul playing music. Absolutely. And I, I yeah. hope that these segments have given everybody the opportunity out there to, to be inspired by the fantastic music making of people such as yourself, Chris. Now, this segment is all about the physicalities of what it takes to do what we do as musicians and performers. And um, I thought we'd sort of spotlight the bass in particular because it's, you know, one of the largest instruments, one of the heaviest instruments, one of the most difficult instruments in the orchestra and one of the ones that gets the least amount of attention. And so that's one of the reasons why 
I really enjoyed doing the Roto Concerto. I've conducted a couple of bass concertos, but I mean, that Roto is just such a great piece and such a great composer. But yes. perhaps you can tell us a little bit about what it takes to get ready for a concerto and what routines you have when you're performing regularly. Just tell us a little bit about what it's like to be in your world when you have to do something really demanding like this. Sure, sure. Thanks, Sarah. So first of all, as you mentioned, the bass is a rather difficult instrument to play. And um, maybe people would probably be surprised, most people, if they had a chance to try pushing down the strings on a bass, how much pressure it actually takes to hold the string down. It's quite extreme. And so it's a very physical instrument. And uh, from the muscles in your hand to how you use your arm, shoulder, back, your whole body to play the bass. So playing music requires, um, especially on the bass, but for any instrument really, requires really being aware of your body. And uh, as I studied bass, I had the fortune, good fortune to study with a great teacher named Paul Ellison down in Houston when I was done in Vienna. And he really emphasized um, an awareness of your body and uh, yoga was part of our base practice, was getting familiar with yoga because it really helps to orient yourself to the base in a natural, more helpful way to play. Um, and so I still do yoga as much as I can uh, as a way of preparing to play bass. And I stretch regularly um, when I'm uh, playing to avoid injuries. Uh, so physically, there's a lot that goes into preparing to play uh, besides for just learning the music. Learning the music is the, the first step, but there's so much more after that once you know the music. Um, and mentally, it's a, it's, there's a lot of preparation when you're gonna play something that's very high stress, like a concerto or a recital. Um, the mental preparation is, is just as important as learning the music and being physically ready. So there's, there's so much that goes into it. Absolutely. And um, though we are actually pre-recording this segment, I do want to invite people to write a comment in the chat because myself and Chris and also Alison are going to be there with you tonight in the backstage chat as opposed to um, on the screen live because of all the, the challenges that go into um, well, recording through Live and Facebook, we, we've yep. experimented quite a bit, but we wanted to get this one just right for you. So please do post your questions. We are waiting and here to answer them with you tonight. So Chris, uh, the, um, when we talked about what we could share in terms of excerpts for bass, in terms of solo section, there aren't too many times that the basses really get the spotlight. I mean, there's a few symphonies, Mahler does it. Um, yes. So we were digging and seeing what interesting excerpts could, could we share with people that really spotlight the physicality. And um, you reminded me of the Pulcinella that we performed together not so long ago, I think in 2000, March of 2019. And so we're going to play a little excerpt where the bass gets featured as a section and the trombone, also the lowest orchestra of this particular uh, chamber orchestra setting that Stravinsky uses uh, and the piece is called duetto so it's really a duet between the trombone and the basses but also he spotlights the solo bass so you'll hear Chris playing as solo bass and just to make it a little bit interesting for you to um, watch we thought we'd put up the score of Stravinsky's Pulcinella and you can see if you can follow along with the CB, which means contrabass uh, solo line on the score. And there is a repeat in the score. So at that point, we thought we'd make it more difficult for you and push up a picture of Chris and, and Stravinsky and then see if you can find your way from there to the end. So this would be a fun excerpt for you to listen to. So here it is now, Chris playing solo with Symphony Tacoma and Stravinsky's Pulcinella, the movement number six duetto.
Whiskey's Fortunella. And if you're watching with us on Facebook Live tonight, please take a moment to take a comment, share your thoughts on that wonderful performance. And if you can share this post with your friends on Facebook, we can um, share these programs with, with everybody and uplift people's spirits at this time. So uh, also joining us, in, in addition to Chris Burns, I have the great pleasure of uh, introducing some somebody who's been very important to me in my physicality of conducting because um, she's a physiotherapist. She's a real expert in um, what muscles get used when it comes to pretty much any physical sporty activity, which we know that music making is part of that. And I thought it'd be wonderful to have Alison and Chris talk together about the physicalities of playing the bass. So let's welcome Alison Unterreiner, my coach and uh, physical therapist to join us right now. Hello, Alison. Nice to see you both, Chris and Sarah. Hi, Alison. Uh, it's really good to be with you. Um, I just wanna introduce myself a tiny little bit. Um, I've been a physical therapist for 39 years. Um, and for the past three years, I have come to know and love Symphony Tacoma. I've taken a very special interest in the, in the physical qualities that are necessary to be both a musician and a conductor. Um, it's, so it's, it's been a privilege and a joy for me to get to work with a few of Symphony Tacoma's musicians and with Sarah and to get to know the entire staff of the symphony. And now I'd like to say hi to Chris. Hi, Alison. Um, Thank you for your to, work. I have to admit that um, I've perhaps at times been much more of a symphony watcher than a listener um, mm -hmm. because I can't help but be intrigued by the by the physical qualities that are necessary to to be a musician. Um, and I've really had my eye on the bass players for quite a long time. Um, so I'm excited to have a chance to visit with you, Chris and to watch you play and then um, to talk a little bit about the the physical aspects of playing the playing the bass and how you prepare physically and um what the, what those demands are of of playing your very special and unique instrument so uh we're going to uh to watch a video of you and then we'll talk a little bit more on the other side sounds good so the i believe the video we're about to watch is uh, from a recital I did a few years ago, um, and it's a piece by the bass virtuoso Bottasini, uh, who lived in the 19th century, and he wrote this piece of a fantasy on the opera Lucia de Lammermoor by Donizetti, and enjoy.
to see you play that beautiful piece. Thank I'm you, Allison. Really, I am really intrigued with the position that you have to get yourself into to reach the bass from the top to the bottom and play mm -hmm. all those various notes. And I'm, I'm curious to know just how that feels and does it feel natural because you've been doing it for long or is it somewhat of an unnatural position to be in and you just have to get used to it? Great question. Some of the range of the bass feels more natural than other ranges. And with playing the bass, something that all bass players have to figure out is whether they want to sit or stand when they're playing the bass. And if you watch our Symphony Tacoma bass section, some of them sit and some stand. And mm -hmm. audience members are often curious about that. I used to sit, and then I figured out that um, I had more freedom and flexibility in my body and encountered less pain and injury when I stood because I can move as I'm playing subtly, but it keeps my body freer while I'm playing. And because you really have to play, when you play the bass, you really have to play from your feet all the way through to your uh, fingers. And if mm -hmm. you, I find for me personally, if I'm seat, seated on a stool, for me personally on my bass, um, I get kind of uh, locked at the waist. And so mm -hmm. that causes problems. So I like standing when I play. That way I can reach uh, from the low notes that are around my head height all the way down. And that's a mm -hmm. distance of, you know, I don't know, like three or four feet from right. the, one, one yeah. note yeah. To, the, to the highest note. Yes, I have definitely noticed that. Yes. So if your, your position is standing, then your base of support is in your feet. Yes. Not not on your seat sitting. Right. Yeah, for so, me, uh, no. Hmm? No, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I, I'm careful to say for me personally, because everyone's body's different. And so every bass player, um, and, and every bass is different too, the size of the bass, the, the shape of it. And so mm -hmm. every bass player has to figure out what works best for them. So some people, uh, many people love sitting, and they mm -hmm. do it in a combination with a footstool or different positions for their legs. And so I'm just saying for me personally, I found standing to be the, the best solution for me with my base. Do you ever get fatigued in any particular part of your body and, and notice that during a performance? Yes. Um, if there is passages where there are lots of lots of notes continuous without stopping, my mm -hmm. arm is raised up, especially if it's in a lower position, my arm might be raised up like this for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And so the blood, the blood flow to my hand um, might not be working as well after a while. So um, mm -hmm. I'll have to, the soonest I can have a break, I put my arm down and I'm, I'm stretching out my fingers in the performance mm -hmm. to get the blood flow back to my fingers. So in, in preparation for that type of positioning during a, during a performance, is there anything you do on a routine basis in terms of your, your training outside of playing the um, gym work? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you do anything to, to work on part of your body that you need for playing the bass? Absolutely, yeah. So yoga is great. Um, stretching is very important. Uh, if I'm doing a lot of playing, I have to be doing that on a daily basis, um, especially uh, a number of stretches for the shoulder, elbow, hand, wrist. Yes, that's a big part of it. If you do become fatigued during a during a performance, is there some sort of a body cue that you um, that you get for yourself, or do you hear yourself playing differently if you're tired? Mm, that's a good question. Or do you try never to get to that point so that your playing never suffers? Well, I suppose you're right. That's always the goal. But I, if it's a if it's a long performance, if it's a, a really big symphony or piece opera we're playing, then I, I um, it, it's I think it's inevitable that you're going to run into fatigue in some way. And so, uh, subtly stretching while playing is good, especially mm -hmm. with my back. I might move in certain ways, twist around to to kind of free up a little bit. As I mentioned, when uh, there's a lot of left hand playing. Um, and it's stressful on my fingers, um, there, there will be times that my fingers start to go numb while I'm playing. And I know that that's a danger sign in right. some ways, but, but, but it's, not, uh, it's not a sign, luckily, of tendonitis or anything yet, but mm -hmm. it's just over, 
overuse in that moment. So then I, that's the blood flow issue and I have to get the blood flowing mm -hmm. back in there. Um, so there are little things I do in performance, absolutely. Oh, you asked if, if I can tell when um, you know I'm getting fatigued playing. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, you can always tell if you're tired, of course. Um, if you have too much tension, that's interesting because things yeah. just do not work right if you're building tension. So vibrato, mm -hmm. which requires a loose, um, a loose working of the muscles and relaxed use of the muscles, um, that will tighten up and you can tell, oh, this is not right if, if your vibrato is not working out right, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. and, the, and there's a resonance to the instrument you can get when you have a real natural free uh, approach to the instrument. And so if mm -hmm. you're losing that and getting a tighter sound, then that's a sign that you're not, um, you're, that you're, you might be fatigued or tense. You're, you're building up tension and not, not playing more naturally. That is that is really interesting. Yes, it's it's nice to hear the the other side of that, which is not getting tired, too much muscle tone, so that you can't play the music and, and communicate it the way that you want to. So yes, yes. Thanks very much for that education. I have learned sure. so much from all of the musicians, and now I know more. About so um, blessing and curse for you. I'll be watching you um, <laughs> when we get back to live performances. So Chris, one more thing before we go, I would love uh -huh. for you to um, show us another video of um, some of the unique ways that the that the bass contributes to the to the symphony and how you play it. Okay, sure. So we have another uh, video ready to play. That's of me uh, performing a, a much different style piece than the first one. The first one was uh, the Bodicini, which was a 19th century romantic style piece. This next one is by a modern um, Finnish composer, Rata Vara, who just passed away um, a couple years ago, actually. And this piece is called The uh, Angel of Dusk, and it's a concerto for bass that he originally wrote for orchestra and solo bass. And then he wrote an arrangement a chamber arrangement for two pianos, percussion, and bass. And I did this also in the recital a couple years ago, and um, I'm happy to share some of this with you and our audience, because um, it shows the bass doing some, some different types of playing. The first section of it will um, show a very modern musical sound, but the bass is, is kind of traditionally played in a traditional way. And then this next section, slows down and it shows me doing some different things with the bow and my left hand. I'm, I do, I make some unusual sounds with the bass and Radovara was really uh, interested in the different sound effects you could make with bass. And a lot of comp modern composers especially love the range of possibilities for bass um, from harmonics to double stops to sound effects with the bow. And so some of that's in here and I hope you enjoy it. Can I ask you one more question then while we're talking about the... Oh, sure. I know that you hold it in a few different ways. Um, can you explain which one you have chosen for this particular piece? Right. Uh, as a quick answer, um, I play German bow, which is a way of holding the bow that's kind of... Uh, my hand is underneath the bow. And many other bass players play French bow, which their hand is over the bow. Um, mm -hmm. I it's interesting you asked that because when I do the sound effect with the bow, I do switch to a French bow hold um, in, in the video. So you can watch out for that. Great. Thank you very much. Watch.
So we're back after having heard uh, play another beautiful piece for us. Um, we're going to make a little transition here now into um, another of uh, members of the symphony, uh, Mary Jensen, the principal flute player. One of the concepts that is integral to athletic development is called the specificity of training. And it means that um, we need to work in a way that directly corresponds to the activity and the requirements of that activity that the athlete, and in this case, that the uh, musician is, is going to do. And in this case, we're going to be talking about the flute and, and see the final phase of, of training for the principal flute player, Mary Jensen, um, in her rehabilitation from some neck, shoulder, and arm issues. So in the video, we'll be showing shortly, um, we will we'll, we'll talk about some of the things that has done to a strength and endurance that she needs very high demands of her professional flute playing. Playing the flute requires a tremendous amount of positional strength, the ability to hold the flute quite still while also generating the force needed to, to blow with control. So we are developing what I would call strength endurance. It's the ability to perform a movement, hold that position as needed. And in, as needed. And in Mary's case, I think we know that holding the flute up for a long period would put a lot of strain on that right shoulder. And this is the parts of her rehab program that we worked on pretty extensively. In addition to balancing out her postural strength and her, her spinal movement, because she tends to be in an asymmetric position when playing the flute, we wanted to she could rotate her trunk in the ways that she needed to. Having the ability to open up her chest for getting good deep breaths is important. And we worked a lot on flexibility and mobility for that, for that very purpose. Having the spinal extension and again, the ability to open up your shoulders be back where they need to be in order to to be in position to hold the flute and then to generate the force that you need to do the flute is very important as is the the strength in her shoulder muscles so that she can be sitting upright and holding herself in a in a strong and um, correct position for the demands of her of her flute playing so one of the other standing positions um, involved in the in the orchestra is of course the conductor. The athleticism involved in conducting is is tremendous. It involves an incredible amount of strength, endurance of balance and motor control. And all the while being able to preserve the spontaneity and the creativity that involves in, in communicating the musical performance. I know that Sarah also has a basic fitness routine that she does that includes running. And look at the video of her twice weekly training sessions with me. So having moved from watching Sarah during her performance to watching some of the things that she does in her training sessions, I think you see all of the requirements, strength, balance, control, the ability to move from a slow motion 
a very fast and powerful motion, the ability to communicate the music in a variety of ways. Um, we have her on a balance board, both feet on it, while moving her right baton like and her left hand again communicating the music in a way that involves a lot of strength and coordination and balance and control the the preparation involved in being on the podium is is evident when you watch sarah conduct and it is also i think evident by watching how hard she works during her training sessions to be able to to have the the motor control and the and the strength of movement, along with the very delicate motions that are necessary for different parts of, of any piece. I'm gonna stop talking for a bit so you can just watch the incredible control and strength that she has in working with these, these standing on one foot on a board that is tilted backwards and forward. I believe that if we were at a symphony when this is finished, we would probably all say brava. Great. Uh, well, thank you. I know that I wouldn't be uh, what I am on the podium these days without tremendous guidance from South Sound Physical Therapy um, and your help um, directly. It's um, it took me a while to come to realize how much physical therapy would be um, advantageous to me as a conductor. I I came to Allison originally because I had um, two knee surgeries actually, and that made it pretty hard to keep up um, balance and strength on the podium. And as one gets older, you realize that exercise it becomes even more vital if you're going to be able to be active and do the kinds of things that you need to do as a conductor. So. I'm really glad that um, that Multicare recommended I, I um, find the right physical therapist, and now now I'm probably fitter than I than I was ever. So thanks to you, and thanks to Thal Sam for doing such a great personalized job for myself and the musicians too. It's been a pleasure, and I I believe that I have I have learned. I have learned more and gained more than I have than I have given or done. Um, I knew nothing about orchestral music before I met you and came to the symphony. So I, I thank you and the symphony for me into uh, family and um, looking forward to a season where we can actually all be together in person again. So I can eyes on you and Chris and Mary and uh, learn more about how you do what you do. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. We've got just a couple of brief questions that came in before you say goodbye. Um, and these were sent in. Uh, people would love to know uh, when we're going to continue these Facebook lives. And we hope to be back in the fall. But over the summer, we will be continuing some of our um, online virtual programming. We have some wonderful education initiatives that we have begun. Um, including something called Meludia that's being made available to some 2,500 2, young people for ear training. So, in, in fact, Chris, you've been uh, a part of that endeavor to uh, circulate with that, that within the schools. Thank you very much for your collaboration in that. Yes, thank you so much. It's been great. The kids uh, uh, have really loved working in it because it's a very intuitive, engaging uh, uh, program, Meludia, with that ear training. And I'm just so happy that you knew about it and Symphony Tacoma was able to help our students uh, have access to it because I think it's going to be really fun for them to keep working in that. That's super. 
And, and we are also having a new uh, education program launched for young musicians. And that is a project we've developed called Eternal Light. And we're calling upon all the young musicians in the area to send us in a little piece of music um, or a rhythm or a bass line, or if you like a picture that inspires you, that will kind of unite us during this time where we're um, having to really reflect upon the challenges of our world. But let's keep in mind the wonderful light that we can share and shed on our community with the love of music. And that's inspired by uh, Wolfgang Amadeus's Mozart's Requiem, the final movement. So please, um, I think you'll see a picture on the screen at some point for that project, Eternal Light, and you can go to our website and read more about that if you're interested. Please do send us something in if you have questions. And for any of you, if you have suggestions for what you'd like to see and hear from us, please send them in, please put them in the chats. We do read those and uh, we'll try to do everything we possibly can. We'll be rebroadcasting some of our previous concerts with Symphony Tacoma over the summer. And uh, we'll also be trying out some salon concerts with our musicians over the summer as well. So please stay in touch with us over this time. I want to thank you very much, um, Alison and Chris, for, for your dedication to Symphony and your tremendous patience as we try out this new platform. Uh, which throws us new challenges every week. Um, you've been splendid guests. I want to thank also Chris's uh, chair sponsor, uh, Bonita and Kenton Lee, for your generosity. And really, really appreciate all of you who have continued to support the symphony during this time. And if there's anybody out there who'd like to make another donation, uh, please go to symphonytacoma.org and click on the donate button in the far right hand corner and let us know how we can use these funds and, and what you'd like to see uh, coming from Symphony Tacoma. And finally, I thought I would leave you with one more video of special moments with Symphony Tacoma. Um, initially, I um, had made the, the video to explore diverse and creative programming and special endeavors with Symphony Tacoma. And we thought this might be a nice way to wrap up things with you tonight, a collage of some of the special moments and memories that we've done together with Symphony Tacoma and also Symphony Tacoma Voices, as well as some remarkable soloists and remarkable composers, uh, Dan Ott and Sandy Das. So please enjoy this final uh, segment and thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to being with you as soon as possible in person with Symphony Tacoma. Good night. How can we go anywhere without music? How could we take music out of human nature? It's part of us, and that's why it's so important. Music is just so life-affirming. When we hear something and we are moved to tears or inspired, we know it touched something in us. To my students, I'm their teacher. For my children, I'm their mother. Uh, to my orchestra, I'm their conductor and I'm music director of Symphony Tacoma. I'm constantly motivated, I'd say inspired by people, by stories, by history, by where we live, the extraordinary nature of our world. I've uh, done all sorts of projects musically as a performer, as a collaborator, as a curator of programs. I really love commissioning works, bringing creative new pieces to light. When I look at creating projects, I'm, I'm really connecting the dots and I look to the resources of what does the community love, what does it care about, what does it have.
recently we did Beethoven 9. This is just as important as it was in Beethoven's day. You know, brotherhood and sharing of our common understanding. And this is where we have to look, is to the common ground. I'm motivated by the mission. Uh, and for me, that mission is helping us understand each other. And, and music is, is a greater tool as any. I think that is the greatest thing that music can do, is, is to bring people together, mind, heart, and soul.